Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. So we're here at Aspen Ideas Health. How great has this been so far? Right? What an amazing festival. Festival is, the, is exactly the perfect word. It's not a conference. It, it's a festival and a celebration of, of science and logic and humanity and empathy and all these good things. I am here. I think she needs no introduction, but I will give her the introduction with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who's the director of the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. <laughs> And Rochelle threatened to introduce me, but I will just do a quick introduction. So I'm Dr. John LaPook. I'm the chief medical correspondent uh, for CBS News. I do 60 Minutes uh, uh, and uh, Sunday morning in, in every venue. And in fact, I had the pleasure of interviewing Rochelle, and we did a piece on 60 Minutes in March, which was, uh, was a real privilege. Uh, and, and for uh, me as well. And a leap of faith of her to let, let 60 Minutes in. <laughs> I'm also a professor of medicine at NYU Langone Health. Uh, I'm an internist and a gastroenterologist. Uh, so um, we're going to start off. Um, and th what's fun about this, and we talked beforehand about what we could do here that we wouldn't normally do, say, on 60 Minutes or in the news, in the 12 to 15 second news clip that you have. Um, we want to start off getting a little personal um, and show you, give you a glimpse into not Dr. Walensky, the head of the CDC, but, but Rochelle Walensky, who is a physician first, a practicing physician, and where she comes from in, from that angle. So talk about that, about um, Rochelle Walensky. You. First, I'm delighted to be here, and delighted to be here with you. So thank you very much. Um, maybe I'll just rewind to 95 when I was a house officer. I won't, I won't go the whole way, I promise. But just to say, um, you know, I am an infectious disease physician because in 1995 when I graduated from medical school, I became an intern at, in Baltimore, in inner city Baltimore. Um, and people were dying of AIDS. And that's what they were coming in with and that's what they were dying of. Um, and in that year was when we were gifted the science of the cocktail, when we finally could tell people in December, I remember, um, that you might live with this disease and not just die of it. Um, and that really motivated my interest in infectious diseases. It motivated my interest in understanding how this chapter was going to go for HIV. Um, but also, it motivated my interest in equity, because not everybody was going to have access to these what were $15,000 a year drugs, what are now about $50,000 a year drugs, um, and how, um, how we were going to deliver care to those who were most in need, who were most stigmatized, and who were dying of this disease. So, you know, if we fast forward to 2020 um, and what um, happened with COVID, and I will tell you it was March 6th when I got the page. Um, from our lab that we had our first COVID cases related to the Biogen outbreak in, um, it, at Mass General, and it was cases. And, and like in that moment, everything changed. But it was, um, it was really interesting parallels about things that we didn't know about this disease, who was going to be um, most impacted by this disease. I, I used to say and still say, COVID came to our shores among people who ride airplanes and take cruises. And it rapidly went to communities that didn't have the resources to quarantine, even though that's what public health needed to do. So that is sort of what brought me to public health, brought me to medicine, brought me to infectious diseases, um, and ultimately, I guess, brought me to a phone call that I wasn't expecting um, in November of 2021, or 2020. Um, I'd love to go back to those parallels between uh, AIDS I was an intern in March of 1981. We saw our first patient with AIDS, and you were there at the beginning of that, too. And of course, one of the first really bad things to happen was pointing fingers at groups of people and saying, that's your fault. Mm -hmm. And you probably saw that. People dying alone, people whose families weren't supporting them. I mean, it was, there were a lot of parallels. It was certainly a different disease and a different time. We learned a lot. We leveraged a lot in what we learned in that. But um, yeah, it was it was it was ugly. Um, and yet, there were so many beautiful pieces of humanity that came through, of community that came through, of physicians, caring physicians, when and and providers, nurses at bedsides when families were not. So um, th there were a, a lot of parallels. Um, 
for good or for bad, um, for both of those diseases. And let's go back to that phone call you got in November of 2020. 2020. So paint the scene. Where are you? <laughs> um, well, maybe I'll rewind a little bit. Um, I was in a patient room. I, I'm going to forget the date. It was the teens of November. And my son called me. And I, I was gowned and gloved. We, we were seeing it. And I was in a patient room. And my son called me. And they, he said it was a Saturday. And he, he wouldn't stop. I usually don't answer my phone when I'm gowned and gloved. But when I get these incessant calls, I sort of excuse myself, take off the gown and gloves. Is there an emergency somewhere? Um, and he said, Biden won. <laughs> I said, they made the call that Biden won. OK. Um, so I was you know, going about my business. I had been on call for a couple of weeks in a row. And then a week or two went by. Um, and um, uh, I, I was in the hospital. We, remember, this is COVID. I was in the hospital um, every day, because our, our patient care, our providers were in the hospital. So I wanted to be there with them. Um, and I, I had excused myself to go to a, a meeting with my chairman and actually came back and there was a um, phone message that said Ron Klain called. And it was a 202 number. And I was like, well, I know that name, but why would Ron Klain call me? Um, and how did he get my number? Um, so I, um, I first called my husband and I said, Ron Klain called me. Um, and he said, well, you have to call him back. And what <laughs> Sound <laughs> advice. Thank you. Um, but whatever he says, whatever he asks, don't say no. That's what he says. Um, because he knows me. <laughs> and he knows that I would have had all of these concerns. Could I do whatever it is he was going to ask of me? Um, so he said, just listen and, and don't react, just don't say no, and say whatever it is, we'll talk about it, and you'll get back in touch with him. And um, so it's a good thing I called my husband first. Would you have said no? You think? Um, no, I probably would have been less confident about saying, like, let me get back in touch with you. I might have said, Atlanta, CDC, what? Um, which is not what I said. Um, but, but, you know, I, I would have not been able to sort of digest it as well in the moment. Do you remember how he put it to you? Because here you are, and the, the reason why I'm going deep on this is there's this theme in public health, right? I mean, you're, you're a physician taking care of one patient at a time. And that is a whole different thing than being a public health person taking care of millions of people, potentially. And, and we'll come back to it later, giving advice for hundreds of millions of people where if you are wrong 0.1%, it's a ton of people who are affected. So yeah. how was it presented to you? Well, so I, I will say he, he was pretty concrete. He said, we're looking for somebody to lead the CDC. Your name has come up, and we'd be interested, if you're interested, to talk to you more about this position. Um, and so I sort of digested that and told him I would get back in touch with him. What was interesting from my perspective on it is I have sort of this academic career in research and public policy. Um, and that research is like, how do we how do we create guidelines that blanket the most health that we can for the dollars and resources that we have? I did a lot of work in cost effectiveness of HIV, both domestically and internationally. Um, and then the question is, how do you take those guidelines and put your stethoscope on and use those guidelines to treat this patient who may be allergic, who may have a, a family history of X, who may have, you know, you can't necessarily take all of those guidelines. Um, and you there's really no, can't. There's, no, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no voice of God saying, wait a second, no, not I mean such it. a good idea. Um, you, you know, when you put on your stethoscope, you treat that individual patient, and you're guideline-driven and guideline-motivated. But you know, there may be something about that patient that not, doesn't allow you to, you know, apply the guidelines in that singular situation. And I really want to remember to come back to that when we start thinking about making these tough decisions for the country. Right. right. So you go home, <laughs> and did you did you do a columns? Yeah. Pros. Oh yeah, um. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I did, and yet, and I went started to go through the vetting process and trying to really understand what it would mean for me and what it would mean for my family, um, and yet, um, there has always been this: if somebody thinks that you can make a difference and that your history, your voice, is the right one for the moment, and you know, I'll remind folks we were just heading into the alpha surge, the pandemic was 
clearly not over. Um, things were not good. And um, somebody tapped me and said, we think you're the one who can make a difference here. And so um, the answer in my mind you know, was not going to be no. If I was going to be selected, then, then I was going to be it. <laughs> Had you ever met a president of the United States before? No. Was it cool? Yeah. <laughs> did you, yeah, did you go to the Oval Office? I have been to the Oval Office. I, I, my, <laughs> my, my memory is it's hot. Like, it's pressure. <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> you never watch um, West Wing? I, mean, I just have, to get I the... have. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's, I mean, it's exciting and it's enthralling and it's um, hard. It's hard work. The expectations um, and, and the desire to get it right. I, you don't, you you want to get it right, and especially in this pandemic, there's been uncertainty. And um, you know, one of the things that has been so interesting, I did write a New York Times op-ed just after I was nominated about how we were going to turn this, how we were going to sort of open the next chapter with my tenure, and what that was going to mean, and that I was going to lead with science. And to me, it was obvious that leading with science meant that there was going to be uncertainty. Um, I think that wasn't obvious to everybody, um, that science and somehow meant certainty and that we would always have the answer and always know the right thing to do. Um, and that uncertainty, as we've discussed, plays out on the evening news um, when that uncertainty used to play out in scientific conferences and scientific dialogue. And even if there are 12 pieces of recommendations and everything is stone cold in agreement on 11 of them, the uncertainty is what plays out on the evening news and that's hard. And you said, you said, you just want to get it right. And in our 60-minute piece, <laughs> there's, a, there's a walking shot at the very end where we're just going to, we're going to wind it up. And now, now, she doesn't really understand, I think, that we're recording her, right? <laughs> um, but, and we may or may not use, it's a leap of faith to mm -hmm. say we're going to use, we're not going to use anything inappropriate. But as we started our walk, it's a beautiful pond on our right, she said to me, you just want to get it right. And to me, that summed up who she is. Um, she just wants to get it right. You know, CDC has gotten a lot of criticism, and they don't wake up in the morning. How many people? 13,000 yeah, people? They don't wake up thinking, how can we get it wrong today? <laughs> how can we get it wrong today? And um, you said something to me last summer. Mm. We were talking about, and, and by the way, just so you know, I'm fast forwarding through, the through most of the pandemic, because I don't really want to look backwards today. I think this is an opportunity to look forward. But last summer, when it was the whole issue of how long should you be in isolation, and that advice changed, and, and it, was a, it was very practical things you were considering, like you said, you know, most of the country is not listening to the advice we're giving right now, but we want, and we want people to be safe. We, you know, so it was complicated. And you said something to me back then, which was, I never before had anybody question my motives. Yeah, I think that that actually has been one of the biggest challenges. Uh, you know, um, as a physician, you walk in the patient room, sometimes at 8 o'clock at night after a really long day, sometimes on a weekend and, you know, in, during training in the middle of the night. And people generally know you're there to help them and you're there to do the right thing by them. And even if you don't know the answer, you're gonna help them figure out the answer to get to the, the, the best we can do right now, the most we know right now. And I've, taken, I've been, had a clinical career for 25 years. So I, I've had that for 25 years, that gift of uh, the privilege of taking care of patients for 25 years. Um, and you know, all of a sudden you're thrust into a media world where people are telling you that you did the wrong thing or that you, you evaluated the evidence in this way rather than that way or that these guidelines were not the right ones, um, somehow with some nefarious intent involved. Um, so that was eye-opening. And of, of course it's challenging. Everybody's an epidemiologist, right? <laughs> you go on Twitter. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I, I think, you know, five years, what, hopefully five years from now, we look back and go, why am I following all these people, you know, <laughs> these epidemiologists, um, and want to be epidemiologists? Okay, so we're now here yeah. at the wonderful Aspen Ideas Health Festival, and you're looking ahead. So what are some of your 
top priorities? What, how do you see shaping the CDC as you go forward? Yeah, I think one of the things we've learned a lot during this pandemic, and I will say CDC has a strong 75-year history, but never have they confronted a pandemic of this size and scope as what was dealt to them um, in 2020. Um, and one of the things I think that this, this pandemic demonstrated, first of all, to all of the world, real challenges with health equity. Um, so that has to be the foundation of everything we do and, and so much of what I've believed in in my entire career. Um, but also that our core public health infrastructure is frail. Um, and and I, when I think about the core public health infrastructure, I think about our workforce, I think about our data tools, and I think about our laboratory capacity. And just to unpack that a little bit, um, we have had this, what I call roller coaster funding for there's an emergency and then you know we borrow from one emergency to get, get, get to another without a true investment in the infrastructure. So um, we in the last decade have had H1N1, we've had Zika, we've had Ebola, we've had chikungunya, we now have had COVID. And we're, uh, an analysis from the De Beaumont Foundation found that we're about 80,000 public health jobs in deficit. Um, so through this last decade, we have not invested in public health, and that is everything from community health workers to data analysts to contact tracers to genomic epidemiologists to physicians and state health phys departments, epidemiologists. So there's just this massive lack of that infrastructure and workforce. The other is data, and this has really been a challenge during this. We, we can't, we can't um, implement things against what we can't see, right? So if we don't have a good view of the data, and, and we receive data at CDC from over 3,000 jurisdictions, and some of it comes in by fax, and some of it comes in by Excel, and some of it comes in from a cloud, and it's our job to compile and then to deliver it back in real time. And so we, we don't have interoperable data systems um, to have them all connect so that we can actually see it in real time. So data to me um, is, is supremely important in what we need to do, and I, when I think about data, I think about our infrastructure and data, making sure the pipes connect so that one data piece can talk to another, so that our um, immunization systems can talk to our death registry, so we can see if immunized people were vac uh, were vac or uh, people who've passed have been vaccinated, or whether our electronic health records can look at vaccine. So all of that connection. And then the second piece that I think is really a challenge for us right now is our data authorities. So if, if we were to have this beautiful infrastructure um, of all the pipes connecting, are the data flowing through it? Um, and are they th flowing through it with ease? And we at CDC do not have the authority to have those data flow through. So all of the data that we receive is voluntary, voluntarily reported from jurisdictions and states. Um, and we have gotten more of it through the public health emergency um, that is COVID-19, but we're again limited by it um, in, in, so many other, in so many other places. So I think it's both a combination of the authorities as well as the interoperability. And just to, one last piece on this, just to give you a size of this, the sense of the scope, we received $500 million, which I'm very grateful for, made a lot of progress um, during the pandemic for our interoperability of our data systems. Um, and a, about another 100 to 200 um, in our annual appropriations. Um, but a single health system would take $1.2 billion to upgrade to Epic. So there are single health departments that could go through our entire data modernization budget. And so we are working, we've made a huge amount of progress um, during the pandemic, but we have a lot more that we are working to do and we'll need resources to be able to do. So I want to just say that again slowly, the, the, the thing, not the whole thing, but, uh, but I want to say the thing that I, is the most mind-blowing when I found out about it, I had to ask you again, really, which is the CDC does not have the authority to demand that the data is sent to them. And during the pandemic, there were some emergency powers that were, so, were given, but that may run out. 
it, well, it will go away after the end of the public health emergency. So things such as the CARES Act gave us the ability to receive laboratory data. So we get PCR data, um, but we did not get it until we had the public health emergency and the CARES Act. Um, if you're running the CDC trying to find out where to put resources on where you have the most cases, if you don't see them, you don't know where to deploy those resources. So it's really, it, it's been a challenge. CMS has the authority to look at hospitalization data um, uh, for COVID. We, we have been, you know, kicked around for not reporting hospitalization data, but it took us months in order to get those data, COVID hospitalization data, from using a CMS authority that was then the data delivered to us. So, um, and, and I will say, you know, one of the challenges, we are hoping to, to retain some of that after the public health emergency goes away for COVID. Um, we'll work with CMS in order to be able to do so. But we're reliving the challenges again in monkeypox. Um, we don't, are, we are not necessarily, we're working well with our state partners. I don't mean to imply that we're not, but um, we, you know, we don't have, can I tell you who with monkeypox has been vaccinated? Can I tell you the demographics and that our vaccines and our testing for monkeypox has been, um, uh, there has, there's been, haven't been inequities. I can't. Um, we're in a similar situation in terms of trying to control an outbreak that is now diffuse around the country without the data to be able to see it. So um, it's like, I'm gonna tell you who's in this room right now. Oh yeah, my eyes are closed. <laughs> um, is there an approach that you think might work to make this better? So we do need to do the hard work of data modernization. And to be clear, that's gonna be hard before it gets easier. When we get to our, uh, an interoperable data system and, and we will have to work with all of our health departments in order to be able to do so, we will be in a much better place. The data will be fluid in, in, its ability, in our access to it. What we can't do yet is we don't yet have the authorities to receive it. And what we're really working to do now is to talk with local and state health departments to say, we want to work synergistically with you. We want to receive the data in concert with you because you also want to know from us what's happening in the next town over, what's happening in the next state over, because as we have seen over and over again, infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases don't respect borders. Now, I won't even bother. I guess I should ask you, will there be another pandemic? Um, you know, because we had COVID doesn't mean we won't get flu. Right, right. So um, we have to be prepared for it. Um, and boy, I certainly hope not. Um, and we will, I hope, um, learn from many of the hard lessons that we learned. Um, but we haven't yet gotten to a place where we are better off. And that's the hard work that we have in the years ahead. And eventually, I guess everybody, including you, have said to me, of course, eventually, we're going to have another pandemic. It's just a matter of time. And you would hate to think that we didn't learn the lessons to say, OK, now we're better prepared. I, I want to turn to, again, the things that we haven't talked about in the 12 to 15 second sound bites. How are those 12 to 15 second sound bites we let you have on the evening news? <laughs> so tell me the meaning of lice. <laughs> yeah, Not the exactly. meaning of lice. The meaning of lice you can do in 12 seconds. Yeah, those meaning are, of those life those is hard. hard. <laughs> Terrible. Because okay. sometimes you snip them to like eight. <laughs> no, it's, it, and that, that is a challenge and why this is so beautiful. But I would love you to go a little bit deep on all the things that the CDC does. You took me into the museum. You took me around into the corners. You took me into the control room. Um, emerging pathogens, just to look what's, what's coming down the pipe. Tell, tell, give us a little sense of the stuff that those 13,000 people are doing that yeah. nobody, that people take for granted. Well, it's just, it's really an, crazy, an, an incredible place. And the, the, the subject matter expertise and experience in just a wide swath of people. I remember when I was first like coming on board and thinking, oh my God, we do that here? And we do that here? Um, it was, because, and I knew CDC. I, like, if you put a C in my Google bar, it went up to CDC, right? Like, that was, I knew it well. What's the that? We do that there. What's the that? Um, so there's, um, well, maybe I will just say, in public health, um, the success is that you all never hear about it. And that's a hard way to get funding, right? So we had over 63 foodborne outbreaks last year. Um, we had West Nile in, in... How many outbreaks? 63. 
separate ones. So 63, we're, we're actively following salmonella, two outbreaks of salmonella right now. Um, we had a, a lethal bacteria through aroma spray um, that was an incredible investigation you and I have talked about. Yes. Um, and, um, and, and real true disease detectives figured it out because it was sprinkled around four different states not endemic to the United States that they were able to find. We're doing work in opioids, we're doing work in mental health, we're doing work in tobacco cessation and prevention, we're doing it, work in firearm violence. We're doing work, we work in 60 countries across the globe. We've delivered 12 million people antiretroviral therapy around the world. Um, we're working in, in zoonotic, um, you know, we have 20 years, decades of experience in monkeypox prior to anyone in this room ever hearing of it. So, I, I mean, really the, the span of um, infectious diseases, non-infectious diseases, and really partner outreach with our, our partners, which we rely on um, around the country and around the world. And you took me back into a, a lab. We had a gown up. Mm -hmm. And what were they doing back there? Uh, genomic, se uh, genomic sequencing, is that the lab? Yeah. yeah, so we were doing genomic sequencing. We've been doing genomic sequencing and, and really grateful for resources through um, the American Rescue Plan to scale up our genomic sequencing. And now we can do things like wastewater surveillance. And so when you, we think of like the tragedy of the last two and a half years and where are we gonna find the silver linings to do better next? Wastewater is going to be one of them. Can we look for antimicrobial resistance, which mind you, was the biggest, one of the biggest public health threats before the pandemic. Lots of work going on in antimicrobial resistance at the CDC. And maybe just to divert there for a second, um, you know, during the pandemic, we, we lost some incredibly hard-won gains in antimicrobial resistance um, because people come into the hospital with a pneumonia and an infiltrate and a fever, and guess what? They may have COVID, but they also get antibiotics. So there was never, in, in our hospital anyway, before I left, we had never used more antibiotics than we did during the pandemic. So um, lots, of, uh, lots of losses that we have to regain in the, in the battle in, against antimicrobial resistance. And another thing I discovered the NIH is doing and you're doing in partnership is these emerging pathogens. You know, what's the next one that's going to hit us? So you're looking at all these different families and all yeah. kinds of crazy names that you can't keep, keep track of even. And there are people who are looking at them and sequencing them and wondering, okay, what would it take to make a vaccine so that you're poised, you're ready to make a vaccine? These are the concerns. Yeah, I was going to say, we, I, I had the great pleasure of going to our Fort Collins site um, just y yesterday um, and seeing the work in our vector-borne diseases that are going. We had nine new vector-borne diseases in the last decade. Um, and part of that is related to a space we haven't even talked about yet, which is climate and health. Um, the only government agency looking at climate and health. So, so you know, how does the intersection of vector-borne diseases and the fact that we have three times the number of Lyme cases than we had 10 years ago, um, and what does that mean for when in the season people are getting Lyme, earlier in the season, where across the country they're getting it um, because of expansion of vector-borne diseases? Okay, this is one of those stories where you can choose the, the pathway you go down. <laughs> do you want to do climate and health, or do you want to talk about... Um, Gun violence research. You know, I'm yes, but <laughs> um, I'm gonna. We're gonna. I'm actually gonna speak a little bit more about um, climate and health tomorrow. Yeah. So let's okay. talk a little bit about uh, firearms. It's firearms. So let's. Ju I want to set it up. People here probably know that in 1996 there was congressional act action that made it. Basically, the result of it was that there was a, a, a real. Um, uh, handcuffs on the ability of the CDC to do research into firearm violence. Um, that's ch changed uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there's been some funding now made available. And um, Megan Rainey yesterday made the point when she was talking about this subject that imagine that for 20 years, it's actually 1996, so, so 24 years? Mm -hmm. Imagine for 24 years that you couldn't do any research into cars, car safety. Think of all the research that, that went into cars. You couldn't do any research into heart disease prevention. You couldn't do any research into stroke prevention, diabetes. So we lost 24 years. So now we're here. And talk about what, where you're heading. Um, well, maybe I'll just start by saying 
I mean, it's been tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, and, and those are the ones we're hearing about. And when people say to me, is firearm violence a public health issue, um, we, we've had this conversation. I, I did a little bit of the math on Evaldi. Um, if you took all of the people in Evaldi and assumed that um, they had an average life expectancy, over 1,300 years of life were lost in that shooting. Um, it's really extraordinary. So that's a public health problem in my mind. Um, we, you know, you're right, we lost 24 years. And, and you know, I, I think that there's this concern that if you say the word firearm or gun, that the next word is control. And, and I think that so much of what we need to do, and Tony Fauci did this in the 80s with HIV, is bring people to the table, bring people from all different walks to the table. Um, I imagine that people who are, own firearms don't generally want other people to be hurt by firearms. So how do we get to a place where that doesn't happen anymore? Um, we just had a, a piece in our Vital Signs publication that demonstrated that we've had a 35% increase in homicides related to firearms between 19, uh, 2019 and 2020, the largest we've had um, in the last decade. So um, huge, huge, um, increases over nearly 80% of homicides are related to firearms, nearly 50% of suicides are related to firearms. And while we're hearing about the, um, the mass casualties, during Memorial Day weekend, there were 180 lives lost due to firearms that were not related to a mass casualty. So we're only hearing about the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think we need to do research on things like what age should children start learning about firearms if they have one in their home? How do we teach them about safe storage? How do we teach them about being safe in a community? How do people who own firearms think about how they keep their firearms safe? Um, those are, we, 26 to 24 years of life, of uh, years lost, we haven't answered those questions. And so that's the kind of question, bringing everybody to the table agreeing on common things. We don't want people to die at the hands of a firearm. Um, how do we get the research moving forward from there? And also, you know, as a physician, I wasn't taught in medical school how to have a conversation about gun safety. Right. Um, if, if you're, and if you are a gun owner, it maybe is easier for you. And, and at, the, at the session last night, they talked about that. And teach us, right? And we want to know. How do you teach your kid? I, I went to a 4-H club where they were teaching kids to shoot it, there was an eight-year-old who was learning, which was great. She was learning how to t shoot safely. What is, what is the right age? What is the right way to do that? Yeah. We could go deep into, deep into that, but I, I'm, I'm, you're funding some research, right, into this at, yes, yes, at yes. the CDC. So that's a, that's a new it's thing. It's new since 2020, and we just have, um, I'm really looking forward to the fall. We have some of our, those research projects that are starting to mature, and we'll be starting to see some data from them. But really, how we implement and, and work against community violence um, and uh, bystander interventions, and, and really a lot of important research that we're way behind on. And how you identify who is that person who might snap. And, and, or, or commit, commit I don't, a homicide. I'm not even no. sure we could get, we're there yet. Yeah, but, that, but that's a tough. It's gonna be, that's gonna be a hard question. Yeah. Because as you know, many of, well, mental health is, is often blamed for many of these. Um, most people don't have a mental health history before these things happen. So I have to add that a few days ago on CBS uh, News, we did a piece about this. A beautiful piece, in fact. Thank you very much. Um, but I was, we actually did the deep dive on the data, and it turns out that um, the amount of mental illness in Canada and the United States, for example, is about the same. But the United States has eight times, more than eight times the amount of, of uh, homicide deaths from firearms as Canada. So it's not simply, and, and, and the experts that we, we've got together, people who, the head of the American Psychiatric Association from America, from Canada, and they said, look, there's actually, it turns out, there's no increase uh, th that whether or not somebody has mental illness underlying is actually not a good way at all of predicting who's going to commit violence. And so um, you're ending up stigmatizing a whole group of people. The, I, I looked up the numbers, 21% of Americans have some mental illness diagnosis, and 5.6% have a serious mental illness diagnosis. And so you're stigmatizing people 
when actually it's not a very good way of figuring out. Right. So then the question is, well, if, if somebody pulls the trigger, you know, what's good? they can't be in their normal state of mind. And they both said the same thing. Don't confuse mental illness, underlying mental illness, with severe psychological distress, which can come from a number of things, as we've discussed, whether it's you're, you're isolated, you're, you, you were fired, you feel, you feel that you put upon, you broke up a relationship, on and on and on and on, or, you, or an opioid. Which is acute and perhaps short-lived. And so the idea is if you could identify that person, this is the red flag, so-called red flag laws. Some people don't like that phrase. If you can make it so that you identify them and then make it less likely that they can harm somebody else, then that's one approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, the bottom line is we've, we've talked about it. It's complicated, right? It's complicated. It's complicated. And truthfully, I, I do think that having community at the table, community help us understand what are your challenges in ownership? What are your challenges that, what, what are your concerns? What are the threats you're feeling as we're having these conversations? Um, and how do we learn from you? Because you know, I, I guarantee that the vast majority of people who own a firearm want to keep their firearm and do so safely. So and one of the things you said to me that really resonated and, and they said last night again was bring gun owners to the table. You know, you got to have all that, that input. So I don't know if you noticed we're in a pandemic. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> um, and even though I don't want to look over my shoulder and talk about woulda, coulda, shoulda, I do want to talk about where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And it's very obvious that people are fed up. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on psychologically. You and I have talked about the fact that there's a whole generation of kids who are going to have adverse childhood experiences. And, and, and that's going to be for decades. Um, there's also something going on right now when people get a diagnosis of COVID, even when they're vaccinated and even when they're doing OK, there's a cognitive dissonance between what the COVID, that word, meant two years ago, potential death, and the fact that they know intellectually they should be OK, but yet it, I've had patients who are just panicked, just out of proportion to the reality. And then there are people who are right now are so fed up, they're saying, you know what? Don't ask, don't tell. I don't, I don't want to know. I, and, and I even, I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, I even heard of a case where somebody tested positive and it was in a work environment and they were told to go to work anyway. Uh, and so I'm wondering if people are just declaring, they're, if they're, there are wide groups of people who are declaring the pandemic over, going about their lives, and, and what you would have to say to that. So I asked you like 27 questions there, but yeah. it's just an opportunity for you to spiel on this. Yeah, maybe I'll just start and say 100,000 cases a day, we're in a better place than we were. Um, we've been stable at 100,000 cases a day for several weeks now, and that doesn't imply that things have unchanged. What's happening is it's moving around. So it has been 100,000 cases you know, centered in the Northeast, in New York, Connecticut, it's now much in Florida, mountain states, and, and um, California. So it's about stable in numbers, but it's moved around the country. We still are at 250 deaths a day, um, and that's like way less than 3,000 a day, thank goodness. But in my mind, 250 deaths a day is still too many. Um, the deaths that we're seeing are generally among people who are either elderly, frail, many comorbidities, who've had a lot of vaccine shots or um, people who are unvaccinated. And that's currently where we are right now in terms of the numbers. Um, you know, the anecdote you told me just made me sad. Um, and it, I, I recognize that this is where we are, where we are and people are fed up. Um, but as I, as I mentioned to you, you know, if I had a bad cold, I'd think about like not going to work so I didn't infect anybody else. If I had the flu, I would not go to work so I didn't affect anybody else. And so it just, it really, I think, is a statement on our lack of being willing in this moment to protect thy neighbor. Um, and I think that that is, um, I, I do hope after people are less internally focused because the pandemic has been so hard that they can be a little more externally focused and realize that there's goodness out there and if we start protecting one another, we'll all be better off. Do you see an arc of how this winds down? People talk about it becoming endemic. There'll be waves. There'll be new vaccines that maybe are a little bit more universal. Um, but w w for people thinking, I'm fed up with the mask. I'm going out. I'm wearing the mask. You know, 
but I'm fed up with being indoors wearing a mask. And Broadway is saying, as of uh, July, July is saying, no, you don't, they're, they're voluntary. So how do we, have you thought about that? What, of course, yeah. you <laughs> I, I've often And that was the worst question of the day. <laughs> have you thought about the fact that people need to live their lives, Rochelle? <laughs> Um, but, but tell us how you've thought about that. Well, so first, I think that was a question in disguise <laughs> because I've always been told don't tell people what's going to happen in the future because we don't know. Oh, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm going to like. But how set do you think about yeah. it? That's, that's what I want to I'll set the table with I don't know what's going to happen in the right. future. Um, interestingly, what's happened over the last six months is we've moved from new bad variant, new worse variant, to more transmissible subvariant. You, everybody's been hearing about Omicron, BA1, BA2, BA2121, BA4, BA5. Um, those are all Omicron. We haven't heard about like a new bad Greek letter. So I don't know if or when a new bad Greek, bad Greek letter is coming. Um, and that would be a game changer and I hope not a bad one. But if we are in the, in the sort of mode of future Omicron subvariants that happen to be more transmissible, might be more immune evading. Um, you know, we may be in a place where we continue to have these increase in cases, but the amplitude is lower and the severity is less. And that, you know, may happen for several months ahead before it fizzles. Um, so that's how I'm thinking about it. I don't, you know, what we, what we don't know is what's going to happen with a new vaccine in the fall. Um, I do think we're going to need more vaccines. Um, so that's kind of where I am right now. It is, it's, it's promising that, what, that we have had what I call a decoupling of cases, hospitalizations, and death. We have seen many more cases, and, and we get criticized because we're not counting all the, um, the rapids. I know we're not counting on the rapids, I'm aware. <laughs> that is not lost on me or any of us. And one of my favorite lines from somebody at the CDC was, you don't need to count the raindrops to know how hard it's raining. Oh. Um, and so we can tell by the half a million to a million PCRs we're doing every day how we're doing in, in areas around the country. Um, and the rapids have an important part of our armamentarium in terms of knowing that you're safe to go see a loved one and, and so. Well, to put this in perspective for people who may not know, there, so there are seven coronaviruses, four of them cause the common cold. And I remember asking Paul Dupre, great virologist from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, is it possible that the four that caused the common cold started out as viciously as this, but it was way, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago, and over the years it sort of got less and less deadly or we got more and more immunity? And, I, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah it's not only probably. possible, it's probable. So if that's probable, what does that say potentially about this sort of? So that's you know, actually where I was sort of getting at it. In my mind, I was getting at, like, one day, years from now, we may be at a place where COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, becomes something like the common cold, that you know, the, we have a lot of cases. They don't cause a lot of severe disease. They don't cause a lot of death. They're a nuisance seasonally, um, and it, you know, but it may take us some time to get there. We have a few minutes for questions, but before I do that, I just want to give you one last um, chance here to, um, to maybe tell people something that they don't know about how you've come at this from the, the, the physician's point of view, and now you're in a public health role, what it's like to be making decisions for hundreds of millions of people with the potential of being, of, of having, you know, results that, that aren't easy to live with when, when even if you're 99.999% right, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing I'll say is um, these have been uncertain times. We have had uncertain amounts of data, um, and we have had to make decisions because I firmly believe that no decision is a decision, and that means you're actively living with the status quo. And so sometimes you have to make a decision in the absence of complete data. Um, we wish we would have more, but we don't. And so we will make a decision and then evolve. If more data come forward, then we will, we will analyze it. I, I do want to just 
give a shout out to 13,000 people at the CDC. I, I will never forget the gun, gut punch that was the Barnstable County outbreak in July last year. Um, it was a Friday evening, we saw the data, it was clear that Delta was breaking through the vaccines in terms of cases. Um, and that was just a hard night. And um, I needed some analysis done um, in order to start making some decisions over the weekend. And um, I talked to the incident manager at the time, we were talking in the evening, and she said, well, I'll call the data on call team and um, they'll work through the night, they'll have the results for you by morning. And I said, we have a data on call team? <laughs> um, but, but we do. Um, and we have people at CDC who, um, when the cruise ships were stranded offshore, repelled from helicopters to drop tests to, um, to you know, passengers and crew. Um, we have people who have been deployed to Operations Allies Welcome. Um, so you will never know their faces. Um, and we have had challenges, um, and I, I can't promise there won't be more. But I will say that you will not know that they're out there working for you. So I just wanted to um, say that on behalf of them. I'll quickly remind you on a personal note, you t telling me about how when the results came back from of 95% efficacy, just quickly say what your reaction was uh, to that. Oh my God, it was, I was walking from my car to Mass General, it was raining. Um, I wasn't in this position yet. I've been told, well, why weren't you getting your news from CNN? It's like, because I wasn't in this position yet. Um, but I do remember when it came live on my phone and, and I was- You meant CBC. C I CBS. What did I CBS. say? You said CNN. You no, meant CBS. No, CD CD CBS. Yes, I wasn't working for CBS. No, I'm, no, I'm God, kidding. I'm teasing you. That <laughs> no. You're watching CNN instead of CBS. Oh, that's what I... No, you meant CBS. Uh, you were of course. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. In fact, it was a direct line. It was a direct line, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and it came through, and I thought, 95%. Like, we're going to be okay. We got this. And, you know, it, it was around the time we had a morgue truck parked outside of MGH. So it was um, that juxtaposition of like, we're gonna be okay. Yeah. So this is, you know, and the reason I wanted her to tell that story is this is personal. You know, she really takes it personal. And that's the person who um, I think people, I, I, I'm fortunate enough to see because I spend a lot of time and she takes my calls and, <laughs> and all that. Um, but I think people out there when they're watching on television with the 12 to 15 second sound bite and with, who knows how things are edited? Um, they don't. Re they don't really see the Rochelle Walensky that a lot of people who know you well see. And I think that's one of the things that I wanted to come across. In it, you know, in addition to all the sort of stuff about where we're headed, but I just I think it, there's value in knowing that the person at the at some point it's a leap of faith. Who is your leader, and and and, and where are they coming from, and. Um, you know, she's coming from the position of being a, a, a physician first that, that was tapped. And, um, and uh, anyway, I think, I think I'm going to just uh, ask for a round of applause <laughs> for, um, <laughs> for, yourself, for your service. You're stuck to the thing. You know, um, we, we, we're going to do a Q&A. There's two minutes and 12 seconds left. Um, so um, I think that's, this is a great way to end. So um, you got to know, know when you've done your job and you get off the stage and always leave them clapping. So thank you all. You've been so attentive. and, and uh, all the people out there watching, and thank you, Rochelle. <laughs>